In this video, I'm going to explain why Social Security is an entitlement program structured like a Ponzi scheme, which can be proven with this one article straight from the Social Security website. On January 31st, 1940, the first monthly retirement check was issued to Ida Mae Fuller of Ludlow, Vermont, in the amount of $22.54. Ms. Fuller, a legal secretary, retired in November 1939. She started collecting benefits in January 1940 at age 65 and lived to be 100 years old, dying in 1975. Ida Mae Fuller worked for three years under the Social Security program. The accumulated taxes on her salary during those three years was a total of $24.75. Her initial monthly check was $22.54. During her lifetime, she collected a total of $22,888.92 in Social Security benefits. This chart details her covered wages and payroll tax contributions prior to filing her retirement benefit claim. And there you have it, proof that Social Security is an entitlement program structured like a Ponzi scheme. But you may not see the math, so I built this for you. As stated, Ida Mae Fuller was born in 1874. To give you an idea of how long ago that was, she was born when there were only 37 states. She turned 1 in 1875 and 2 in 1876, shortly after Colorado was admitted to the Union. She could have been one of the first Americans to visit the Statue of Liberty in 1886 because Ida Mae Fuller is 12 years older than the Statue of Liberty. She got her first job at age 18 in 1892, when the Social Security tax rate was zero because it didn't exist yet. In fact, she's actually older than the 16th Amendment to the Constitution that was passed in 1913 that lets Congress collect income and Social Security taxes as they do today. She lived through World War I and could finally vote on her 46th birthday after the 19th Amendment was passed, granting women that right. She lived through the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression, which was the catalyst to pass Social Security, because it was deemed proper to provide for the general welfare of those who were entitled to benefits. Which really triggers some people when I say it like that, but look, it's the seventh and eighth words of the law that passed Social Security. Which reads, an act to provide for the general welfare by establishing a system of federal old age benefits, and by enabling the several states to make more adequate provisions for aged persons, blind persons, dependent and crippled children, maternal and child welfare, public health, and the administration of their unemployment compensation laws to establish a social security board to raise revenue and for other purposes. So social security was the first welfare program in the United States that I am aware of to protect and safeguard against the hazards and vicissitudes of life. But those aren't my words. They belong to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Here is FDR in a video signing social security into law in 1935. Today, a hope of many years standing is in large part fulfilled. The civilization of the past hundred years, with its startling industrial changes, has tended more and more to make life insecure. Young people have come to wonder what would be their lot when they came to old age. The man with a job has wondered how long the job would last. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefit through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. We can never ensure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life, but we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-stricken old age. It seems to me that if the Senate and the House of Representatives in this long and arduous session have done nothing more than pass this security bill, Social Security Act. The session would be regarded as historic for all time. Ida Mae Fuller turned 61 that year, but Social Security taxes didn't start getting collected until 1937, when she was 63 years of age. As a reminder, Ida Mae Fuller contributed $24.75 to Social Security, $9 in 1937, $9 in 1938, and $6.75 in 1939 before she retired in November of that year at the age of 65. She started collecting benefits two months later in January of 1940, and her first monthly check was for $22.54, or $22.54 in 
or $270 for the year, which means she was paid back the $24.75 she paid into Social Security and any interest earned on her contributions in less than two months. Social Security tax rates were 2% when she started collecting benefits and would rise to 3%, 4%, and 6% by 1960. The full retirement age, or FRA, when benefits are decreased for retiring early, was increased to age 67 for anyone born in 1960. So anyone born in or after 1960 is effectively paying more for less years of benefits than anyone born before 1960. Ida Mae Fuller is now 86 years old and in her 21st year of collecting benefits from her total contributions of $24.75. In 1965, the Social Security Amendments Act was passed, better known as Medicare and Medicaid, which she was eligible for because she was entitled to Social Security benefits because she contributed $24.75. She continued receiving benefits until January 27, 1975, when she passed at the age of 100 and collected total lifetime benefits of $22,888.92, which means that for every dollar she paid into Social Security, she took out $924.80, or for every year she contributed to Social Security, she collected benefits for 11.7 years. So where did all the money come from to pay Ida Mae Fuller benefits in 1974 if she had received all the money she paid into Social Security by February of 1940, 34 years prior? Well, it probably didn't come from anyone born in the year after her in 1875 that was still alive because they would be 99 years old and also collecting benefits. Or anyone born before 1909, for that matter, who was still alive because they would be older than 65 and collecting benefits also. So it most likely came from Americans born after 1910 and still paying Social Security taxes who are in their 64th year of life in 1974, and everyone born after that up to and including the Americans born in 1956 who are just entering the workforce in their 18th year of life and just starting to contribute to Social Security at a tax rate of 9.9% and earn their entitlement to benefits. Which means that if you paid Social Security taxes prior to January 27, 1975 to earn your entitlement, a portion of your taxes were paid to Ida Mae Fuller and any other American that was collecting benefits. Which is almost every single person collecting benefits today because Ida Mae Fuller died in 1975, the same year that these 4.3 million Americans who were born in 1957 turned age 18. And those 4.3 million 18-year-olds just turned 65 this year. Which means that Social Security just added the most beneficiaries in a single year than it ever has in history. And even though it is collecting 12.4% in taxes per year from participants, or more than six times the 2% tax rate it charged Ida Mae Fuller between 1937 and 1939, it is still taking on stress. And before we move on, notice that Ida Mae Fuller only had to pay 6% of her wages to earn her entitlement, the 2% times three years, which means an American attempting to earn their entitlement will pay more in one year than Ida Mae Fuller did over her entire lifetime which was a known windfall of benefits that was built into Social Security to get early participants to support passing the act and help them get over their fear of passing a program that would be considered socialism, a statement that is controversial and that I will prove with the annual reports straight from the Social Security Administration's website. The 1940 report shows that the trust fund had a balance of $1.7 billion the month before it started paying benefits to Ida Mae Fuller and the other 220,000 Americans like her that filed for benefits that year. This chart shows expected Social Security benefits and taxes from 1941 to 1990, but it's a little hard to read, so let's fix that. From its onset, Social Security taxes were expected to cover benefit checks, which would produce program surpluses from 1941 to 1960 and grow the Social Security Trust Fund. But after 1961, Social Security taxes wouldn't be sufficient to cover benefit checks, and there would be shortfalls. So it was known that Social Security tax rates would have to be increased to maintain benefits because it would no longer be self-sustaining, which is required by law. And that was the structured windfall benefits that was given to participants to help them overcome their fears of a socialistic program. But let's pull a future report and see how close those estimates were. This report's from 1982. And this table shows that the trust fund was at $21 billion in 1955 and $23 billion in 1981. So if you contributed taxes in or before 1981 to earn your entitlement, your taxes were already paid out to other Americans because the trust fund didn't grow. Money in, money out. And all these negative signs here indicate more money was being paid out in benefit checks than collected in with Social Security taxes, a sign that the Ponzi scheme was starting to collapse by the mid-1970s, about 35 years after it was started. And all these negative signs indicate that Social Security's fund would have gone negative sometime in 1983 or 84, which is not legal to do. 
So benefits would have had to been cut or taxes increased, which is why the Social Security Amendments of 1983 were necessary to assure the solvency of the Social Security Trust Funds, which it did by increasing the full retirement age to 67 for anyone born in or after 1960 who will reach their FRA in 2027. It increased tax rates from 10.4% per year to 12.4% for anyone contributing in or after 1990 to earn their entitlement, which means that anyone born in or after 1972 will pay the most in history for their entitlement, and added the provision for taxing Social Security benefits for the first time to somewhat lessen the windfall benefit that had been received by early participants, among other stabilizing mechanisms. And if we pull reports from 1970 to 2021 and combine that information into a single chart like this one, it shows that those stabilizing mechanisms worked. In 1970, the Social Security Trust Fund had a balance of $38 billion and ran a surplus for five years. This red indicates that from 1975 to 1982, taxes and income collected did not cover benefits paid and there were shortfalls, which drew the trust down to $24 billion. dollars. In 1983, Congress amends Social Security by raising taxes and cutting entitlements and everything goes green again. By 1986, the trust fund is up to $46 billion. The increased tax rates caused the Social Security program to collect continued surpluses, including this 12-year stretch where more than $100 billion of extra Social Security taxes were collected each year than were necessary to pay benefits, which is why the trust fund grew from $655 billion in 1997 to over $2.5 trillion in 2009. It's important to know that this $2.5 trillion in excess Social Security taxes aren't sitting in the trust fund waiting to pay benefits because they were converted to taxes that could be used to pay general expenses through a process called intergovernmental transfers that I explain in depth in this video called Myself IOUs. So anyone who takes the position that I could have done better with my own money investing it for retirement than Social Security is absolutely right. But we as a society would have had to pay these amounts in other types of federally collected taxes if we didn't want our annual deficits that occurred every year since 2001 to be any larger than they were. Which means that if the government didn't collect these amounts in federal social security taxes, it would have had to collect those amounts in federal income taxes, and you'd most likely be in the exact same net income position all those years. Which can be proven in the fiscal year 2021 financial report of the United States government on page 193, paragraph 2, a subject for a future video. One other thing to note before we move on. From 2007 to 2011, the amount of social security tax surplus collected annually decreased from $290 billion to $69 billion a 76% or $221 billion decrease. The reason for this decrease is that 2008 was the first year that baby boomers could start collecting early entitlements because anyone born in the first year of the baby boomer generation in 1946 turned age 62 that year and could file for early entitlements then or up to age 64 or wait until their full retirement age of 65 in 2011. But that's an indication of the stress that is being added to the Social Security structure, and the baby boomer generation will continue to file for their entitlements for the next eight years until 2030, which will cause the annual surpluses to completely disappear and turn negative very soon if they haven't already, which we'll find out in next year's annual report. These estimates are from the most recent 2021 Social Security annual report. And they estimate that if nothing is done, that Social Security trust will be drawn down from $2.8 trillion in 2021 to $142 billion in 2030 as the baby boomer generation claims their entitlement. Which means that in 2031, the trust would go negative, which isn't legal to do, so benefits have to be reduced to whatever taxes collected can cover, which is estimated to be about 78% of the current levels paid today. Now, if you're collecting Social Security benefits, or about to, you probably don't want your benefits to be cut by 22% or more, which makes absolute sense. And I can imagine you saying, I paid into Social Security all my life, which you did and saw on your W-2 because FDR wanted you to feel entitled to benefits to prevent Republicans from dismantling the program after he signed it into law in 1935. Or maybe your position is this wouldn't have happened if the government didn't steal our money. But that's not true because I just showed you who got your money. It was the Americans collecting their checks after their full retirement age, like Ida Mae Fuller or those filing for early entitlements. So instead of saying the government stole our money, you should be saying my taxes were transferred to other Americans participating in Social Security, which is an entitlement program structured like a Ponzi scheme. But now for the trillion dollar question, how do we fix this? Well, we can't do nothing because the Social Security Act will automatically enact cuts as it's currently written, so it will have to be changed no matter what. And we shouldn't do what we did because of globalization. Every time we increase payroll taxes, we encourage offshoring of American jobs. And if we increase the tax rates in the full retirement age like we did in 1983, that's basically asking future Americans to accept a 22% benefit cut to avoid taking one now. 
which doesn't seem ethical and doesn't actually fix the problem, it just delays it again. This is how to fix Social Security. The first thing to remember is that if taxes went into Social Security's fund, they were either used to pay benefits or converted into special issue treasury bonds and used to pay general government expenses that should have been paid with general federal income taxes since 1983 through a process called intergovernmental transfers explained in this video titled Myself IOUs, which means income taxes were artificially low for almost 40 years, so it would be ethical to allow income taxes to be used to fix Social Security for a while to make that right which means we need to fix the tax code, which could be done by combining Social Security, Medicare, and income tax rates into a single unified federal tax rate system. I advocate for that rate to be flat for reasons explained in this three-part series, but it could be a progressive tax rate system if desired. But the key is to make the tax code so simple and transparent that the IRS can make a meaningful dent in the $600 billion of annual tax fraud that is estimated to be occurring today, which I cover in this video called what the hell is the tax gap and who stole $600 billion? That covers the Social Security tax base erosion problem happening with S-Corps, where some Americans get to decide how much income is taxed for Social Security and Medicare taxes by completing a Form 2553. If we keep a separate fund for Social Security, it is imperative that we fix the investments and don't continue investing the excess funds collected for Social Security in special issue treasury bonds, or what I call myself IOUs, now that we are off the gold standard which I somewhat explain in this video titled Modern Monetary Theory, The Flaw. But basically, we have to cash in the debt in the trust funds, which I explain how to do in this video titled Fixing the Debt Ceiling, and invest it in something external to the government, like U.S. corporate stocks, which I explain how to do in this video titled Trust Fund Optimization, which would address the largesse issue briefly mentioned before. And there you have it. That's how you fix Social Security, by fixing the funding mechanism and replacing the underlying investment engine with something that produces real returns and not just debt which ensures Social Security is not structured as an intergenerational Ponzi scheme, which it currently is. And that concludes this video. Share it and subscribe to this channel to support this cause. Because if I get enough comments, likes, and subscribers, I'll volunteer my time to fill one of the two public trustee positions on the Social Security Board that have been vacant since 2016. I'm Stephen Peluga with WatchGuard Capital. Invest your time wisely.